4, 1, 1, 3, 5, 7. There we go. Wonderful. So our Recording next speaker. Recording in progress. Yeah, you can take your mask off. So our next speaker is Dominic Schröder, who's at uh, ETH in Zurich, and he's going to give us a bit more of an introduction into into random matrix theory and some of the key key quantities that appear there, in particular the resolvent analysis. Thanks, Dominic, for coming. And yeah, go ahead. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be in Trieste. Um, yeah, so in light of the audience, I thought today it might be the most appropriate for me not to give like a random matrix talk about the latest, greatest results, but more give like an introduction to one of the key techniques, which is the cumulant expansion. So in the first part of, uh, part of the talk, I will mention the matrix Dyson equation, which is like one of the main equations in random matrix theory, already mentioned by Ben in the last talk. And then in the last part of the talk, I will go beyond the matrix Dyson equation for a concrete model which is maybe more interesting for the, from the applied perspective, namely the nonlinear random matrices um, occurred in uh, random feature models. So, yeah. Okay, so as I said, is it better? So in the first part, I want to talk about uh, correlated Hermitian random matrices. So the setting, the general setting I want to talk about in this part is that you have an Hermitian big, like a large random matrix, let's say complex entries. Uh, and what I always want to assume is that the expectation is somehow bounded because we want to talk about a bounded spectrum in the end. Uh, then I want to be vague here, but I want to have some sort of decaying correlations which make this whole story applicable. There will be a concrete uh, um, assumption in the theorem, but generally some decaying correlations. And then one important assumption is, is that the so-called covariance tensor, which is this S operator here, which is obtained when you take an, a deterministic argument and you sandwich it with the um, mean zero part of the random matrix, and then you take the expectation, so that's a deterministic uh, operator, and you want to assume that this is flat in the sense that it's upper and lower bounded by the average trace for all positive operators. So this is, I mean, it's a quite abstract condition maybe, but what it really ensures is, for example, if you take a, a simple matrix, which is, has just one, one on the diagonal and the rest is zero, and then you evaluate this covariance operator on this matrix, and then you take the BB entry, then this gives you the variance. So this condition somehow ensures that the variance of every entry is upper and lower bounded by one over N, which is exactly the right condition uh, to ensure a bounded spectrum. So that's the flatness. Uh, these matrices you can analyze on three levels, basically. The first level is the macroscopic level. That's the, you ask, what is the global density of states? What is the global law of the eigenvalues? And this is the picture, the, the top picture here. And the message here is, this is not universal. So depending on how you choose your model, this can be anything. Usually it consists of these kind of bumps and cusps, but it's not universal. Then the next level is the mesoscopic level. Uh, this is if you zoom in a little bit, but you, you zoom in at so far that you don't look at single eigenvalues, but you still look at like mes mesoscopically many eigenvalues, that's the next level. And then the final level is the microscopic level, which I don't want to talk about today, but this is shown in the, in the bottom picture. And the, the interesting message here is the more microscopic you get, the more universality you expect. So this is really Eugene Wigner's vision for random matrices. No matter the details of the model, once you zoom into the spacing distribution, you somehow expect this, this, this universal gap distribution. <laughs> An interesting fact is that this formula here is wrong, but it's like very close. So it's like 1% close to the, to the truth, but the formula is not right. Um, so first, the macroscopic scale. So the macroscopic scale ask the question, how do you determine this, this black curve here? So the, the, the histogram is, of course, the, the histogram of the eigenvalues, and then there's a limit. How do you determine this limit? And the answer in this setting is you solve the matrix Dyson equation. So the matrix Dyson equation is an equation in an unknown n by n matrix, which involves the expectation. So A was the expectation of your matrix, 
and S was, was the covariance operator, and you want to solve this equation that minus M inverse at a spectral parameter Z in the upper half plane is equal to Z minus A plus this covariance operator applied to this matrix M. Um, under the condition that the imaginary part of this unknown matrix M is positive definite, this has a unique solution. And what one should think of is that the solution, the solution to this equation really is a good approximation for the resolvent of the, of the random matrix. And once you know the resolvent, then you can go via Steelkiss inversion uh, and get the density. So that's how you compute this black curve in this uh, um, here. And depending on the, on the precise model, actually solving this equation might be hard, but usually numerically you can, you can do some iteration. So it converges quite fast. Um, so that's the density of states, and there's actually an interesting classification. So under quite general assumptions, uh, what you can prove is that the density of states is one-third Hölder continuous. Whenever it's positive, it's analytic. And the only singularities which, are, which can appear are shown in this picture. So you can have these square root edges. So here locally, the density behaves like a square root. And then you can have these cubic root cusps. So when you have a zero of the density of states, within the support, then locally it looks like a cubic root. And that's all that can appear. So you cannot have a quartic root or something like this. Um, and cusps, they don't always appear, but basically when you tune some parameter in such a way that two bumps merge, then you have, have a cusp. So they are quite ubiqu ubiquitous as well. Um, so now to the mesoscopic scale. Uh, let's zoom in a bit uh, and let's state the theorem. Um, so the theorem is that the resolvent is well approximated to the solution of this matrix Dyson equation um, up to the fluctuation scale of single eigenvalues. I will show uh, what this means in the next slide. Um, and here, this is a theorem um, which assumes some polynomially decaying correlations. This 12 here, this is far from optimal. In fact, in the Gaussian case, two is enough. And I assume that one is enough and also the spatial structure is not important. So this was just a, a statement for convenience that you, you assume this polynomial decay, decaying correlation so that you somehow, somehow can quantify what you mean by decaying correlations. And then the statement is twofold. The more important probably is, is the second one, namely when you take the, your resolvent, you subtract the solution to the matrix Dyson equation and you multiply by anything deterministic and you take an average trace, then this is one over n eta small, where eta is the imaginary part of the resolvent. So the imaginary part of the resolvent tells you somehow how fine you can resolve eigenvalues. And the other statement is an isotropic statement where the error is larger. This has a long history of results. Um, I, don't, I cannot mention all of them. But the interesting thing here, I think, is, the, is this fluctuation scale. And this I will show in the next slide. So, According to this um, uh, classification of singularities, the fluctuation scale basically is between three behaviors. So the fluctuation scale is defined like locally at an energy, how big of a window you have to integrate over to in expectation find one eigenvalue. So in the bulk, you expect that you have to integrate over just a horizontal window of size one over n, then you find one eigenvalue in expectation at the cusp, this becomes n to the minus three quarter, and at the edge it becomes n to the minus two thirds. So that's the fluctuation scale. And above that scale, you have a local law in the sense that if you look at distances a bit bigger than, than these fluctuation scales, then you have a law of larger number for the eigenvalues. Um, this is related to the quantiles, of course, of the, of, of the density, in the sense that the fluctuation scale is the, is the difference of two neighboring quantiles. And the important corollary of the local law is rigidity. And rigidity here means that you pick an index i and you order your eigenvalues lambda 1 to lambda n. Then the quantile tells you where the limiting object should have its ith eigenvalue, if you can talk about that. Um, and then the statement is that the real eigenvalue is as close as it can be to the, to the quantile, namely close by the um, fluctuation scale. And I want to highlight that this is something maybe quite unnatural. So for example, if you would just put, put, would sample like independent points according to any distribution and sort them by, by size, 
and compare them to the quantiles, then this is something you could never expect. This is much, much more rigid. So eigenvalues of a random matrix are much more rigid than if you ask a child to draw 100 random points on a line. So this is this rigidity, and the local law implies rigidity in this, in this very optimal form. Um, so um, the proof idea of this optimal local law, this is what I wanted to talk about mainly, is it, it, it uses a so-called cumulant expansion. Um, and what, what one should go back to is really integration by parts. So the, the central idea is that you want to, I mean, the, the matrix Dyson equation is an approximate equation for an approxi is an equation for an approximation to the resolvent. So let's write an equation for the resolvent. It's a triviality. The identity is equal to W, which was the centered part of your random matrix, times the resolvent, plus the expectation of the random matrix times the resolvent minus the spectral parameter times the resolvent. And I want to focus on this first term, the W times G. And for scalar random variables, one has a beautiful identity, which is just integration by parts. So the expect when you take any function f, which is like C1, and you take a scalar Gaussian x, and you compute the expectation of x times f of x, then this has two terms. And if, if the x is, is a centered Gaussian, then the first term is not even there. So basically, this is the variance of x times the expectation of the derivative of, x, uh, of, of, um, of f. This is a trivial exercise to prove. Um, for non-Gaussian random variables, the replacement of this integration by parts, it's what's called the cumulant expansion. So on the left-hand side, we have the same. Just that on the right-hand side, you have an infinite series over the k plus first cumulant of x divided by k factorial, and then you have higher order derivatives. And it's actually an interesting theorem that there's nothing between these two. So a random variable, which is not Gaussian, has infinitely many non-zero cumulants. So you cannot have like the first three or four terms. Um, but either you are in the Gaussian case or you are in the infinite case. But the good news is that higher order cumulants don't matter much, usually. Um, there's a matrix valued an, an, um, analogous version of this integration by parts, which requires heavier notations, uh, be, simply because you have non-commutativity. So the matrix valued integration by parts would be if you take your, your random matrix W and a function of the random matrix, and you want to compute the expectation, then this has two terms. The first term is, again, tri trivial. And then the second term, now here I introduce this tilde, which is an independent copy of your random matrix. So you take an additional expectation, and then you take the directional derivative of your function f in, the, in this tilde direction, and um, evaluate this directional derivative at the original point W. So that's the matrix valued integration by parts. And if, as we are, do, as we are doing, the W is centered, then only the second term survives. So that's the matrix valued integration by parts. And there's also a matrix valued cumulant expansion, which is too complicated to write here. But in, essentially, it, it involves multivariate cumulants. And multivariate cumulants, the, the first few are easy to define. So the first one is just the expectation. The second one is the covariance. And the higher order ones you should just think of as being higher order generalizations of co uh, covariances in the sense that they have the property that when you take the cumulant of two independent subsets, then the cumulants vanish. So this here would be the third cumulant. And you can check that whenever your x is independent of yz, for example, then this here is algebraically zero. So these are cumulants. Um, so how to go from the cumulants to the matrix Dyson equation? That's actually very simple. Um, so I re wrote here again the matrix valued integration by parts. So what we have to compute is we have to compute a directional derivative of a resolvent. And that's the triviality thanks to the resolvent identity. So when I want to compute the directional derivative in this w tilde direction of my resolvent G, then I have to add this epsilon w tilde and subtract what I had and divide by epsilon and take the limit to zero. And then due to the resolvent identity, this is simply minus the resolvent times your perturbation w tilde times the resolvent. So in particular, when I take the expectation of this top equation here, I get that the identity is equal to the expectation of A minus this 
sandwiching this covariance operator minus z times g. And you recognize that this in expectation means that the resolvent fulfills the matrix Dyson equation in expectation. So this is how you get the equation, basically. It's, it's just Gaussian integration by parts. The difficulty is making this rigorous. Um, and to make it rigorous, you replace the Gaussian integration by parts by a cumulant expansion, because usually we work with non-Gaussian matrices. And you prove that the resolvent fulfills the matrix Dyson equation up to a small error in high probability. That's also of key importance. All these statements are in high probability. And then you conclude the local law by a stability argument, because uh, you have a st stable equation, and you found an approximate solution of the equation, so you can conclude that the approximate solution of the equation is close to the true solution of the equation. So um, this concludes the the general part. So this is the matrix Dyson equation, and this is how you can prove local laws for general correlated random matrices. This brings me to the second part, which is beyond the matrix Dyson equation, because the matrix Dyson equation has a feature, um, which is that the solution just depends on the first and the second moment of your random matrix. And there are many scenarios where the random matrix is not described fully by the first two moments. So now I want to show an example where this is the case. And this example comes, is motivated by applications um, uh, also interested to, interesting to many people here, I think. So there is a theorem, uh, which is usually called the Gaussian equivalence theorem. Um, and this says that if you take um, two IID random matrices, W and X. In the application, you would think that W is some weight and X is maybe some data. But here, these are just independent IID random matrices. And then you assume that your nonlinear, you have a nonlinear function, which somehow is centered with respect to the Gaussian distribution. This is not so important. Otherwise, you just have some rank one perturbation. But let's assume this for simplicity. And then the Gaussian equivalence theorem tells you that this Y matrix, so the nonlinear function applied entrywise to this matrix product, uh, has the same global, sing same asymptotic singular value distribution as the one of a much simpler model, namely the one where you don't have any nonlinear function anymore, but you just have some scalar parameters. So here you have a sc here the, this, this theta 2 is just the the integral of the derivative of f with respect to a Gaussian, Gaussian distribution, and the theta 1 is the expectation of f squared with respect to a Gaussian. So that's the, the Gaussian equivalence theorem. And the psi here is independent noise. So the message is, if you have a, this matrix product w times x, and you apply a function entrywise, then this has the effect of adding some independent Gaussian noise. So this is somewhat interesting message, I think. Um, this result, um, OK, and then, of course, maybe I should show you the equation. Um, the eigenvalues of this y transpose y, which is equivalent to the singular values of y, converge weakly to a compactly supported uh, measure whose steel tears transform satisfies a certain quartic equation. And the quartic equation um, depends on... Uh, oh, I think I forgot to say that maybe. So these parameters phi and psi, these are somehow the ratio. This is, uh, everything is in the large dimensional limit, and this result assumes that like the, the ratio of any of these large parameters converges to something finite, and these are the phi's and the psi's. That's, sorry, I think I forgot to write that. Um, so this is the squatting equation. Uh, the original proof of this statement was probably due to Pennington and Vora, who used the moment method, and they uh, assumed analyticity of the function f. Um, then it was extended later to non-Gaussian um, uh, se setting by Benini and Pichet. And how this fits in, in, in the framework today is that last year, together with a master student of, of mine at ETH, uh, we gave a like, resolvent-based proof, which somehow sheds a different light, I think, on this, um, on this theorem. Uh, and as a side uh, product, the proof is a bit more robust, and we can allow for non-analytic non -analytic test functions, and we could also allow for an additive bias, so we could add some, some plus bias here, and it changes the result a bit. So um, the, the, the resolvent viewpoint on this is that exactly this random matrix Y now, so let's recall the Y was the F of WX uh, normalized. This here you actually view as a correlated random matrix, 
And the correlations which matter in the end are the following. So the, fo the first thing is, which matters is that the expectation of every entry is zero. This is due to the assumption that the integral of f against Gaussian noise was zero. And then the variance of any single entry is the theta one. The theta one was the integral of the f squared against the Gaussian. This is not surprising that the variance of any entry is exactly this, by the central limit theorem, essentially. And then what, 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 what's interesting about this kind of correlated random matrix is that it has so-called cycle correlations. So this here is now for every k, uh, you somehow, the, the, the leading co um, contribution comes from even length cycles uh, with fresh indices. And in this case, the, the joint cumulant is related to the deriv derivative of, uh, of your function f. And once you have this result, um, then you easily get this quartic equation, which I showed earl earlier um, using some simple algebra. And this also somehow highlights this Gaussian equivalence theorem in a, in a matrix sense. So by controlling all these joint cumulants, um, we can, can somehow make sense of this appro approximation in a cumulant and matrix sense. So with that, I think um, my time is almost up, so let me summarize. So I showed you the matrix Dyson equation, and I showed you how it can be derived using a inti Gaussian integration by parts. And then I argued how you can use a cumulant expansion to make this into a rigorous proof of a local law for correlated random matrices. And then in the last part of the talk, I showed you an example where all this machinery in some sense fails because the result doesn't just depend on the first two moments, but still the cumulant expansion also applies, also applies to these settings, just that you're not in the framework of the matrix Dyson equation anymore. And I showed you this with the application to this nonlinear random matrix model viewed as a correlated matrix. And then I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for this nice exposition and this nice result. Do we have any questions? We have one. Hi, thanks for the great talk. My question is related to this Gaussian equivalence theorem you were mentioning. Do you expect that you really need both matrices to be sufficiently random or is it a restriction from this kind of techniques? Would it be sufficient for one of them to be sufficiently random? To, to have this kind of result holding, or do you think not? And I think there, there are two levels to ask this question. I think probably to, to, whether you, to, to ask whether, whether the statement is true that even if only the W is random, then I think that the equation changes. I think the, I mean, you, you should not expect that, the equa that for a fixed data matrix the, the equation is, is the same. Um, what one could probably also do and might be feasible is to prove some quenched version of this. So you say you fix some random x with high probability, but then you fix it and then you just use the randomness of w to, to, to still get this equation. Um, for fixed, I think actually I mean, this, this has been done for, for fixed x to, to get this equation. I think this is this iterated Machenko plus two or something like this. I think this has been, has been done for fixed x as far as I know this equation. It's a matrix equation, of course. Very nice, thank you. Um, another question over there, I think. So, okay. Hi, thanks for the talk. So you mentioned this idea that the uh, solution for the matrix Dyson equation serves as a, an approximation of the result. And so I was wondering in, in which sense this approximation holds. So does this mean that if I take, uh, let's say, quadratic forms, A transpose it, uh, the, uh, the resolvent uh, times B, then this quantity uh, gets close to the same uh, quadratic form of the, your, your approximant in probability, say, is, is it something like that, or? And so, in, maybe I didn't understand the question. So the, so the statement is that when you take, uh, let me go back to the statement. So you take your, the difference of the resolvent and the matrix Dyson equation, and then the statement is that if you multiply this by any, either sandwich it between deterministic vectors, that this is small, or when you multiply by a deterministic matrix X or 
independent matrix X, then this is small. But I think you asked whether you can, but yeah, you can multiply by something yeah. random or? Yeah, no, no, it's, I, I, I missed something. Ah, okay, in the, so, so, yeah. so the statement is whenever you multiply by anything deterministic, then it's small. And beyond that, I think it's just not true because if you would fix, if you would choose these, these U and V to be eigenvectors, then you wouldn't expect this to hold. Yeah, right. so it's true whenever you test against something deterministic. Okay, thanks. All right, are there any more questions from the audience? Maybe you gave us a little bit of a cliffhanger when you said, you know, in the very beginning, that result on the spacings that we all know, you know, uh, it's wrong. It's like very close, but there's like 1% missing, I think you said. So what's missing? I, I think the answer is there is, no, there is no nice formula for the truth. And the physicists got this formula using some heuristic arguments. And it's extremely close to the truth. But the, the truth is you have this it's called so-called sine kernel, uh, which is basically tells you that the co correlation between eigenvalues behaves like a, a sign of the difference. And then to get the spacing distribution from this, you have to, you have to do an infinite sum and integral over the sine kernel. And it's hard to do, and I think there is no explicit expression, but the, tr the, the end result is 1% close to this formula for some reason. And Dyson got this formula. I think this formula is called the Wigner surmise, and it's extremely accurate, but not correct. <laughs> okay, that's a nice little bit of anti trivia. Thanks. Uh, Marco, I think you had another question. I was wondering whether the techniques that you described can be pushed. <coughs> Beyond the simple model f of wx, so for example, can you analyze the spectra of deep models, or can you analyze Jacobians, conjugate kernels, anti-Ks? Uh, the short answer is I, I don't know. Um, I think what what's feasible and what has been has been done is if you are in this very special case when the theta two parameter is zero, um, then the, after the first layer, so-called, then this first term is not there, and you, you end up in, in the original setting in the sense that you are, have an independent matrix, and then you can iterate, and this has been done by Benini and Pinche, I think. So in this special case, you can do it. In the, in the generic case, probably take it, tracking the correlations through multiple layers can be quite hard. But I mean, if, you, if I stash in another matrix W just on the left side, can I just look at this? So, so what's the problem? So now I get the product of three, and then I get the product of two, but yeah, and I think in this size thing, independent, right? In, in, so this this sen in this sense, you, you could prove something, just that the, the result will then have multiple terms. We'll, we'll have one term with, with if L is the number of your layers, you will have W1 times W2 times W, and you will have all subsets of these weights multiplied. So you will have a sum of, over many things, but in, 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 the, in the end, I think this is what's probably the truth. Thanks. <laughs> Just that in the, if theta 2 it happens to be 0, then it's very simple. All right. I don't see any more immediate questions. So I would say let's thank Dominic and all the speakers of this morning's sessions again. Recording stopped. <laughs>